Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to The Pastor Study. Today's question is, how can I overcome temptation? Temptation comes from one of three places, the world, our flesh, or the devil. Our flesh is that evil human nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve. My flesh hates God. My flesh wants to be God. In fact, the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon said, quote, Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our worst enemy with us. So the question now is, how can I fight the world, my flesh, and the devil so that I overcome temptation? What we're going to do in this half hour, let's see how Jesus fought the devil, fought temptation. And that'll teach us how to do the same. Would you take out your Bible, turn in the New Testament to the book of Matthew, chapter 4, where Jesus is tempted by the devil. Let's pray first. Father, we pray for anyone who, watching this program, is going through temptation as we speak. And we pray, Lord, that you will, by your Holy Spirit, teach us each how to battle the devil, the world, and our flesh so that we can win instead of lose. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Here's the first lesson. Testing is part of God's plan. It says the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the desert to be tempted by the devil. And that sounds kind of strange because James chapter 1 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So God doesn't tempt anybody. But here it says the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So what's going on here? Well, I think the way we handle this is to say it this way. God indeed tests, but he doesn't tempt. The tempter in this story is not going to be God. It's going to be the devil. But the Holy Spirit allowed this temptation because God still tests us. For instance, Genesis 22, 2000 BC, it says, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice. And boy, did Abraham go through a test at that point. So God doesn't tempt us, but he does test us. So we should regularly pray the Lord's Prayer, lead me not into temptation, but still you got to know that there are seasons where for God's purposes, he tests us. And follow this. The same event in your life can be a temptation from the devil and a test from God. For instance, let's say that your child dies. That's a temptation from the devil. Give up on God. See, he doesn't care for you. And it's also a test from God. My child, will you cling to me even through this grief? So again, pray regularly, lead me not into temptation but we know that there are times God tests us. Verse 2, And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. Here's the next lesson. We battle the devil with fasting. Jesus fasted in Matthew chapter 4. The early church fasted in Acts chapters 13 and 14. And remember, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus didn't say, Disciples, if you fast. He said, disciples, when you fast, do it this way. So Jesus expects us to fast. So let me ask the question. Christian, when is the last time you fasted? And for some of you, the question is, have you ever fasted? Well, I want to encourage you to do something. Pick one day, 24 hours, 
and eat no food. Drink water, but take 24 hours and just don't eat food. Take, you'll, that'll, you'll find you'll have more time on your hands and use that extra time to seek the Lord. If Jesus, the perfect Son of God, needed to fast, you better believe we sinners need to fast. In fact, <clears throat> I, I know a man who was in the homosexual lifestyle for many years. He converts to Christ, and he's, he's for 15 years, he said, he's had no sexual contact, no pornography. 15 years, he hasn't masturbated once. But he said, there was a weekend when I was so horribly tempted, I knew I had to fast or I would fall. I have another friend who told me that he fasts one day a week. Now, I don't think you have to do that, but every Christian, myself included, we should fast periodically to seek the Lord. Verse 3, And the tempter, the devil, came and said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Here's the next lesson. Satan tempts you to doubt your identity. You know, Jesus, if you're the Son of God, well, Jesus is the Son of God. But when Satan wants to get you to sin, he tries to get you to doubt your new identity in Christ. Let me repeat that. This is important. When Satan wants you to sin, he tries to get you to doubt your new identity in Christ. For instance, a woman comes to me for counseling and, well, Pastor Brock, I'm not sure God forgives my sins. And I said, you've got to stand on the fact that you are a redeemed child of God, forgiven through the blood of Christ, washed through the Lord Jesus. And I said, if you doubt God forgives your sins, it's kind of over. And I was trying to get her to stand in her new identity in Christ. Verse 4, but Jesus answered the devil, it is written, and now Jesus is quoting Old Testament scripture, quote, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here's the next lesson. When tempted, quote scripture at the devil. It is said, I believe, that Martin Luther, when he got tempted, he'd sing a hymn at the devil, or he'd quote a Bible verse at the devil. And, you know, let me say, every Christian has their weak spots. Have you memorized a certain Bible passage or two for your weak spot. So you can quote it at the devil when you're being tempted there. I mean, I, I, l let me give you an example. Let's say your weak spot is greed. You like to hoard your money. And you know you should be a generous giver to the church and to world missions, but you got a problem with greed. And you decide, though, I'm going to write a big check to the church. So you write this big check, you're sitting in the pew, and here comes the offering plate. And all of a sudden you're thinking, I don't want to put this check in. And you're getting tempted to hoard. But then you've memorized a verse for your weak spot. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Timothy, instruct the rich in this world not to set their, un on their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with everything good to enjoy. And then you put your thing in the plate. Quoting a Bible verse to yourself and to the devil helps us overcome temptation. That's what Jesus did. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city, that'd be Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle, the very top of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and now the devil quotes the Bible, quote, God will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Here's the next lesson. It's kind of a strange one. The devil can quote scripture. <laughs> You've probably heard the saying, Satan can quote scripture for his own purposes. Um, I like the saying, Jehovah's Witnesses, they can quote the scriptures backwards and forwards, mostly backwards. And just because a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness on your doorstep can quote the Bible does not mean they are from God. Satan likes to quote scripture because it confuses people. I will t I'm a Lutheran pastor. I have been dealing this week with a very liberal Lutheran pastor who is pro-abortion rights. 
He thinks that, that the unborn child is not really a human being, so abortion is okay. So I quoted to him Psalm 139, where the unborn child is created by God in the womb. And, I quote, and to see this, guy, this Lutheran pastor try to quote scripture in favor of abortion, wow, the tap dancing and gymnastics he goes through to try to get verses to say stuff that they do not say. So beware, Satan can quote scripture for his own purposes. Let's look at verse 7. <clears throat> Jesus said to the devil, again it is written, Jesus quotes the Old Testament, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here's the next lesson. Don't test God. Well, pastor, every time I'm alone with my girlfriend on the couch in her living room and her parents are out of the house, we end up doing things we shouldn't. Well, get out of there. <laughs> What are you doing alone on the couch when you're her parents are gone? Flee! Get out of there. Or, well, you know, now that I'm a born-again Christian, I can go to that bar where I used to get drunk, but now I have strength in Christ and I, I won't get, get drunk again, so I can go to that bar. Well, part of being a new creature in Christ is that you run from people and things that used to get you to stumble. I mean, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul does not say to young Timothy, Timothy, stand firm against sexual temptation. You know what Paul says to Timothy? Flee, youthful lusts. Get out of there. <laughs> There's a proverb in Proverbs 22 that says, The wise man sees danger and hides himself. The simple or stupid go on and pay the price. So, in, in other words, everybody, if we all got weak spots. Guard your weak spot. Don't test God in that area. I, I will tell you, a lot of you are watching this program on cable TV. I don't get cable TV in my house because I'm too weak. Regular TV is bad enough. Cable TV can be from hell. And sometimes I do not push that clicker as soon as I should. So I don't even have it in my house. Guard your weak spot. Uh, and parents, should your teenager have a cell phone by which he or she can access hardcore pornography. I have a friend who caught his, dis discovered his seven-year-old daughter had watched three hours of hardcore pornography and he said, I don't think she's perverted or anything, she's just curious. Listen everybody, guard your weak spot and guard your children. Look at verse 9. And the devil said to Jesus, at all these kingdoms he shows, all these I will give you, all the kingdoms of the world, if you will fall down and worship me. Here's the next lesson. When you are tempted, see if you can spot the lie. Now look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 9, and answer this question. Where's the lie in verse 9? The lie is this. Satan doesn't own the world. Who owns the world? God owns the world. So Satan is lying in this verse. And next time you're tempted, see if you can spot the lie. For instance, why don't you, do you see that beautiful woman over there? Why don't you have sex with her? It'd be so pleasurable. And if you do it, then here's what happens. You might get a disease, you might destroy your marriage and your wife divorces you, and what Satan makes look pretty can kill you. He always lies. Jesus called the devil the father of lies. I read of this, this is strange, but there is a farm boy who has a very strange hobby. He can take manure and make sculptures out of it. And he took, a, a, he took manure, made it in the form of an apple, painted it red, and it looked just like an apple. But don't you bite into that apple. <laughs> My point is this. Satan can take something really ugly and make it look beautiful. Next time you're tempted, slow down and see if you can spot the lie. Look at verse 9 again. The devil says, All these kingdoms I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Here's the next lesson. Satan wants you to worship him. Satan hates it when you go to church and worship God, because Satan wants you to worship him. And I've had parents tell me that the roughest hour of the week 
is the hour before church trying to get their kids ready for church and all you know what breaks loose. I think that's because Satan doesn't want you in church worshiping God. I can remember when I was little, mom had to sit in between my brother and I to get us not to fight in church. And I remember the, the last fist fight I had with my brother. I was 20, he was 19, and it was on our way to church. Poor mom. <laughs> my point is this, would you give Satan a cardiac arrest this week? Go to church. Verse 10, then Jesus said to the devil, be gone, Satan, for it is written, and Jesus quotes the Old Testament, quote, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left Jesus, and behold, angels came and were ministering to Jesus. Here's the last lesson. It's okay to pray for angels. Angels came and ministered to Jesus after this horrible temptation he went through. And you know what? You can do that too. You can pray for angels. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, angels are ministering spirits sent out to help those of us who are going to obtain salvation. Now, let me make this clear. You don't pray to angels, but you can pray for angels. New Age people tend to sometimes mix Christianity with paganism and they, they have their own angel spirit guide that they pray to. No. Um, in the, in the Bible, you don't pray to angels, you don't pray to saints. In the Bible, you only pray to God. But you can pray to God for angels. I will tell you, years ago when I was in seminary, weird things were happening to me at night. I was getting attacked by this very supernatural, weird presence. And it happened so much. I went to a Christian exorcist. There was a Christian pastor and he prayed over me, he cast things out of and away from me, and then he said to me, before you go to bed at night, pray for God to send his angels to watch over you through the night. And I want to tell you, every night now before I go to bed, I pray, God, surround and fill me with the Holy Spirit and send your angels to protect and watch over me, and that crud never happens anymore. It's okay to pray for angels. One last thing I want to share with you about overcoming temptation. I shared this years ago on this show, but let me just share this again. Back, way back when, when I was being horribly tempted, I think it was in those seminary days, I can't remember for sure, I had a dream one night. And the dream was I was being chased by this ugly little animal. It was a little animal, but it barked real loud. And so I'm scared to death and this thing is chasing me. I, I run up into a tree and the thing is at the bottom of the tree going, ar, 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 ar. I'm shaking up in the tree. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm never getting down from here because that thing won't leave. And a Christian comes along points his finger at the animal and says, in the name of Jesus, go. And the thing went, ar, 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 and ran away. I came down to the tree and I said to the Christian, but what if it comes back? And the Christian said, just start praising God. It can't stand that. And I woke up. And you know the two lessons I got out of that dream? Number one, Sometimes Tom Brock gets so much in his own tree, he needs another Christian to get him down, the importance of Christian fellowship. And number two, when you're tempted, praise God. So next time you're tempted, maybe just, holy, 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 or what a friend we have in Jesus. Just start praising the Lord when you're tempted. Those are some of the things the Lord tells us to do to battle the world, our flesh, and the devil. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, if Jesus is God, and God, you said God can't be tempted mm -hmm. with evil, was temptation really a temptation for Jesus? That's the hard question. If, if Jesus is God, which he is, was this really a temptation in the wilderness by the devil? Because there's no way the devil is going to win. 
And I heard a professor say this, and this is the best answer I can give you, Jackie. Jesus is fully God, and he's fully man. He's got two natures. He's God and man. And the professor said, he's the temptable, non-temptable one. Because in his human nature, he could be tempted. In his God nature, he could not be tempted. So was the temptation in the wilderness really a temptation? Well, the answer is yes, in his human nature, but not in his God nature. And some of this is, is a mystery and beyond our knowledge, but that's my best answer, Jackie. <laughs> well, it, it's hard to understand because you think that, you know, God can't be tempted. Right, yeah. <laughs> but you're saying Jesus can he, and His Jesus human and nature could be tempted. His divine nature couldn't. Okay. So I don't, yeah, some of this is a little beyond us, yeah. All right, you talked about fasting. Mm -hmm. how, how should a Christian fast uh -huh. for how long yeah. or what's the... Well, you know, there's no, I don't want to do any legalism on this. Jesus never says fast one day a week. In fact, his enemies, the Pharisees, fasted three days a week. So you can do a lot of fasting and still be an enemy of God. <laughs> but, but again, Jesus didn't say, if you fast, disciples. He said, when you fast, do it this way. And so he expects fasting. It's up to you when you do it, how often, for how long. I'll, I'll give you a, a good thought. Take a day now and then, 24 hours, don't eat food, and just drink water, and fa unless, you, unless there's some doctor reason you have to eat food, go, then do it. But most of us can, most of us can go for five days without uh, food, not with wa without water, but without food. So Jackie, it, it just kind of pray about it, but do it. We all need to fast, and I, I confess I haven't fasted uh, like I should, but there you go. Yeah. Okay, could you give us some scriptures that we could memorize that to fight temptation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, are there some good ones that <coughs> if yeah. we ha have the knowledge of those and memorize them yeah. that we can bring up? I'll just throw out what I use. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Like or um, 1 Corinthians 10, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Actually, that's James chapter 1. Uh, you can use that one. Let me do the 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape. You know, sometimes temptation can get overwhelming when you think you've got to give in to it. That verse says there's always an exit. Uh, and one last thing, you pray on the armor. You know, the old stand up, stand up for Jesus, put on the gospel armor, each piece what put on with prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, gird your loins with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the prep. So I pray that on uh, regularly. I pray the armor on in Ephesians 6. So, Pastor Tom, if a person does give in to temptation and sin, what should they do? Yeah, we won't be perfect till we're in heaven. So you can fight temptation, and we all need to fight temptation. But if you fall, 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why do people find it so hard to say that? To, to confess their sins, you mean? To say, repeat that phrase. Okay. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. People don't always believe that. Yeah. And yeah. then they go right back into their sinful right, nature. Right, right. And so the other thing you do, Jackie... You get a priest, and I'm not saying it has to be a literal priest or pastor, but you get a Christian to whom you confess your sins and who will help you battle the devil not by yourself. I think every Christian needs a prayer partner or a priest, someone to whom they can talk about their sins. Accountability puts a dent in our sin life for good. <laughs> what are some of the groups that use the Bible, but they're really not Christian? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I said in the sermon that not everybody that quotes the Bible is from God because the devil quoted the Bible of Jesus in Matthew 4. Groups that say they are Christian and use the Bible and they are not Christian because they don't really believe in the biblical truth. I'm going to mention these are called the cults. Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny that Jesus is God. The Mormon Church, they believe in thousands of gods in the Mormon Church, and you can become a god. Christian science, it's neither Christian or scientific. Christian scientists, they say they're Christians, but they don't believe sin really exists. 
sin doesn't exist. What did Jesus die on the cross for? Um, let me give you a few other. The New Age churches, the Unity Church I would stay away from. I'd stay away from the Unitarian Church. So those are some of the major cults. So where did the devil actually come from? The first thing we learn about the devil, he shows up as a snake in the garden. So now, you know, the, the very popular theory, and I think it's a good theory, is that Satan was created a, a, an angel, and then he rebelled and took some angels with him, and they became the demons. The Bible does talk about fallen angels. So I think it's a good theory, Jackie, but it's nearly never clearly spare, spelled out exactly where the devil came from. So we just, you know, he, G, the devil is not eternal, only God's eternal. So, but somehow, some way, the devil fell, and it's not clearly explained in the Bible. Some people take passages about the king of Tyre in the Old Testament, but they're not talking about the devil there. They're talking about the king of Tyre. So, You know, I think it's hard for a Christian, though, to accept the fact that if God created everything, why would he create a devil? Yeah, yeah. And that's why some people say he didn't. He created an angel who became a, the devil through his own free will. But it doesn't really solve the problem because God knew that that angel would have done that if that's the right theory. So it's, some of this is confusing. Pastor Tom, we've only got less than a minute left okay. and I was thinking that maybe you should tell people what's happening here. We've yeah. just started a new channel we that have. we're on. And well, everybody, when we get more money, we add more channels and God bless a 103 year old woman that left us money in her will. That's why some of you are seeing us that never used to see us, because when we get more money, we, we just add channels. So uh, I want to thank those of you that, that pray for us, that give. In a minute, you'll see the address if you want to give at our website or just send in uh, the, uh, to the address that's going to be there. But uh, we, we praise God we're still on the air nationally now because it's a lot of money, and I didn't know that we'd still be here six years after we started the national ministry. But thanks to you who pray, please do pray for us, and see you next time at the Pastor's Study. Thank you for watching the Pastor's Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Mm -hmm.